Thank you, Allie. All right, glad to have all of you here this morning on this Easter morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's try it again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right, we're so glad to have all of you with us. It's kind of a different day, kind of a different room than normal in here, but we're sure glad for you to be joining us in worship this morning. We have a great service planned for you today, some cool stuff. I hope you, a lot of you hopefully just got to enjoy a great brunch. It was a great meal. Thank you to everybody that was a part of that this morning. We're going to have a great time of worship. want to welcome those of you that are joining us online as well. Happy Easter to you. And uh, may you uh, be speaking of the risen Lord there where you are as well. Hey, um, we want to get this service started, so let us begin by, oh, if you would fill out the blue pads, they're there on the pews, or on the pews, uh, on the chairs there with you. Um, I guess they're not around at the tables, but we'll try to record. It helps us if you record your attendance. Appreciate that. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this chance to worship you this morning. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Lord, we believe you are right here with us this morning. May we feel and know your presence and be changed by it. It's in your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Please stand and worship with us this morning. Happy Easter.
Happy Easter, everybody. Please turn to your neighbors and tell them Happy Easter also. To the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a bag of bones. what I've seen got no choice but to believe these doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so so long to my old friends burden and bitterness you can just keep them moving no you ain't welcome here from now till I walk streets of gold, I'll sing a how you save my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. You pick me up, you turn me around, you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you hear my heart. You changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master. I thank the savior. Oh, I thank God. I've lost another one. I am free. 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 Hell lost another one. I am free. 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 Hell lost another one. I am free. 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 Hell lost another one. I am
band. You may be seated. As you are this morning, we go now to our prayer time. What a day to go to our Lord and Savior, remembering the day um, nearly 2,000 years ago now when Jesus had been dead in the grave for two days. And uh, um, I don't know about your experience. In most of my experience, when somebody dies, they usually stay dead but not Jesus. He rose. It's hard. It's incredible. It's amazing. It's all of those things to believe, but it's also true. And it means so much more than just one guy came back alive 2,000 years ago. It means that we have life and hope in him now and forevermore. So let us go to him in prayer this morning, lifting up our hearts to the God who is alive, who reigns in our hearts, who reigns on heaven, who one day his reign on earth, his father's reign will be complete and all things will be made right. Will you be in prayer with me right now? Lord God, thank you for this morning, this chance to be with you. You are alive and we thank you, Lord, that you are a living God. We, uh, we gather today banking on the fact that 2,000 years ago you rose from the dead and you ascended to heaven and you're now in heaven, the right hand of God the Father. And because of what you did, we have forgiveness of our sins. We don't have to carry any more guilt. We don't have to carry any more shame because you paid the price for us. And Lord, we also don't have to fear death. We don't have to believe that when our 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years are up, that that's it for us. A million years from now, we're going to be with you. Living not just this existence right now, that might not be worth it, but the existence what's ahead of life forever with you, in your courts, in your ways, with others who love you and know you, a place where there is no more sin or suffering or pain or death. So Lord, we just lift up your praises this morning. Lord, you know the hurts and pains that we're carrying. You know the hurts and pains that we're carrying on behalf of others. And so right now, God, in our hearts, we name them and we lift them up to you. And as we lift them up, Lord, we know that we're not just telling you something that you go, hmm, okay, that's interesting. But no. You hear our prayers. You respond even now. Lord, we don't even realize as we've lifted up prayer after prayer, we often don't go back and pay attention to just how many of the prayers we've lifted up that you've answered. But it happens again and again and again. And Lord, uh, just help us to be thankful for every blessing you put in our lives. We pray this all, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. Kids, come on down. We'll spend a few moments together. Here, let's gather over around this right here. Can you all come over here today? Let's come around the altar. Yep. Okay. Come on up, everybody. So it's all right that it's where you, you're where you are, but um, I was trying to get you right here in front of the altar. What do you notice different on the altar today from what's been up there other weeks? What? What are they? Flowers. Not flowers. And I think the butterflies. Yeah, they're butterflies. And you knew what they were. The cross. And the crosses. Well, the crosses were up there. They've been up there a few weeks. But the butterflies. So, why 
So who can tell me something about butterflies? Yeah. They fly. They fly. Um, little, that's true. It's in their name. Little known fact, not made of butter, though, even though that's in the name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you want to say? They're free. Yeah, they fly free. Anything else? Um, so, um, yeah, Emery, what do you want to say about them? They start out as caterpillars, right? Yeah. And then what happens? Well, they are, but how do, what? It, uh, yes, you're right, right. And I'm so glad you said the right word because a lot of people would say cocoon. And a cocoon is not what they make. They make a chrysalis. And so they make a chrysalis. So there's just this caterpillar worming its way around, right, on the tree. How many of y'all have ever seen a caterpillar? Yeah. And yeah, all right. So, and then they go into the cocoon, right? And you would think a, butter, uh, a, a, a caterpillar would come out, right, if anything did. But no, a butterfly comes out, right? So you also notice we also have some of those butterflies over there on the cross, right? Why would we put butterflies up in church on Easter? Could anybody think of any reason why? Butterflies would be something we would bring up on Easter. Why? Jesus is the answer. Uh, good, good, try, good, yeah, good answer there. Why? Because butterflies writhe. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Think about it like this. So, what happens to Jesus a few days before Easter? He dies. And then, yeah, yeah, he dies, but we'll get to he rises up, right? But where does he rise from? The tomb, right? So, sorry if you knew the answer and you didn't get to tell, but that's all right. So, so yeah, so, uh, so Jesus is alive, right? And then he gets killed on the cross, very sad. And then they place him in a tomb. And then on the third day, he rose up. Yeah. So, let me ask again, what do butterflies story have a similarity to the Easter story? Yeah. Watch you next. You're doing great. Yep, it's perfect. Emery, what did you want to say? That? It's okay. <laughs> you would have gotten it right too. All right. So, okay. So, yes. Yeah, so, that's why. So, anytime you see a caterpillar, what should you think of? Jesus is absolutely correct. You should think of Jesus. And I have something here for you to help you remember that. Bye. I happen to have some candy bracelets, one for each of you. And look what it has on it. Has a butterfly on it, so uh, yeah. So um, I'm just waiting to hear this all during the <laughs> the rest of the service now. But um, yeah, I have one for each of you, and so everybody take one. You can just take one. Um, I'll come to where you are. They're they're very similar. So yeah, we'll get. Well, everybody will get one. All right, we got enough for everybody. All right, and when you see these, um, just be sure and get. Uh, to, what are we going to think of when we see a butterfly? Yeah. Jesus and how he was the caterpillar. He came out of the tomb and that he went back alive again. All right. So let's pray. Can you quit? Can you quiet the crinkling while we're praying? All right. Maybe not. Jesus, thank you so much for today and for your love for us. And <coughs> Jesus, thank you that just like uh, that, that the butterfly is such a great example of what you've done for us. Lord, you went into that tomb. You were dead, and yet on the third day you emerged and rose and lived forever and brought life forever for us. We thank you for the butterflies, but most of all, Jesus, we thank you for you. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. All right, as we uh, now get into our offering time, hey. You know, um, 
I would love to think, I mean, I am the pastor, right? So I'd love, the preacher, I'd love to think that, um, that the worship service, y'all are all coming just to hear me talk. But I happen to know that that's not true, that the music is such a huge part, right? Isn't the music great? Hasn't it already been great today? And, um, you know, we were just talking in the other service this morning, by the way, magnificent down here. I, you know, when, when you're in my position here, you get the best of both worlds. You get to be in the service down there for one, and then you get to be in the service down here for one. And uh, there was spectacular music on the other end this morning. There's spectacular music down on this end. Um, so if I were to ask you, how much does this church spend approximately in a year on music? And when I, let me tell you what all is included in that, okay? So that includes all the AV stuff. It includes all the, you know, any equipment that the church buys. I know you all buy some of it, but, uh, but buys for that. It includes the choir director. It includes the accompanist down on the other end. It includes Allie and the other interns. We have uh, three, right? Yeah, three of your interns you gave in Eli. And so how much do you think the church spends a year on all those things together? Yeah. How much? Hundred thousand dollars. You have bid high, my friend, but that's okay. All right. Uh, somebody else want to guess? Yeah. Fifty thousand. You've bid a little low. Seventy-five. Still a little high. Sixty-five thousand is the answer. So sixty-five thousand dollars a year, and yet I think it's a bargain. First of all, most all, uh, except for Allie, uh, everybody else up here is a volunteer. And uh, the folks running the AV back stuff back there, they're volunteers. And, uh, you know, all the choir, well, almost all the choir are volunteers. And, uh, you know, but, but it all happens. And it's, it raises, music is wonderful in church, right? Because it raises our hearts to the Lord. We can, we can sing, we can get our bodies moving. I love it when Ashley's up here dancing, turning around in the middle of the song and uh, all the different things that happen as a part of worship. This is something beautiful. And so thank you for giving and being faithful in your giving. Um, it goes to really honor and glorify our Lord. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for today and your love for us. And God, um, we just pray that you'd be with us this morning. Help us to be generous. Help us to give you all of our passion because you've given all of yourself for us. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
If you're able, would you please stand for the reading and hearing of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, 16th chapter of the book of Mark, 1st through 8th verses. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him, that is Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go, tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God, this and every day of our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. You know, I've been, you may be seated. Uh, I've been thinking about how understated Jesus, God does this resurrection, right? Like, I was thinking about how it would be done today if Hollywood got a hold of it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Resurrection of Jesus Watch Party. Presented by Tostitos. Tostitos, an empty bag and an empty tomb, both mean good times have been had. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how it would be done, but, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ, today w people would want to say, you know, let's have a watch party. Can he really pull this off? You know, it would be kind of like a uh, uh, magic, uh, David Copperfield, that's too old for many of you, sorry about that, but uh, uh, you know that uh, the magic thing where like hey, how can they pull off this amazing feat, Evil Knievel years ago jumping over you know 27 buses or something, how can he make it or over the Grand Canyon um, and often he didn't, but the, the, the truth of the matter is is that it's so understated and how understated is it, well let's talk about this, the ladies, the three ladies, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, um, which, by the way, are any Salomes here? Uh, no, that's probably not the best name in the Bible, but um, not as bad as Dorcas, which is a name. Uh, so the other name for it is Tabitha. If you have a choice between those two, I'd say take Tabitha. Um, but uh, anyway, so they go to the tomb with very low expectations. 
Why do they go to that tomb that morning? Do they go to see that Jesus has risen from the dead? Does it, is that what it says? Is that why they went to the tomb? No. It says they got up early on at the crack of dawn. They had to wait till then because the places where they would go to buy spices, the marketplace wasn't open until there was some light. And so they go do that. And then they're out at the tomb as early as they can. And it's made very clear they're going there to anoint Jesus. Excuse me. They're going there to anoint Jesus' dead body with spices to prepare it for his burial. Forget the fact that actually several chapters before Jesus even died, a lady came and, and anointed his body with oil to prepare him for burial. But go to anoint his body with burial uh, for burial and, and that they're planning to, to do that. And so they're going to see a dead body in an empty tomb, in a full tomb. And their biggest concern on the way is how are we going to get in? Because they had seen the day or two before. I mean, these are some real pessimists, right? My mom was always a pessimist growing up. My dad was more the optimist. My mom, pessimist. I think they've kind of evened out through the years. But I do remember that when I was a kid, you would walk down the hallway toward mom and dad's bedroom. And there on the wall, just straight ahead as you walked in, was a picture of this sad little puppy with this sad little face looking at you right there like that. And here's what it said. It said, the good thing about being a pessimist is that you're never disappointed. Yeah. Uh, which is true if you think about it. The, best, the good thing about being a pessimist is that you're never disappointed because you aren't expecting much. So the ladies weren't expecting much, right? They are expecting a dead body. And let's be clear, their expectations were not met. So they had low expectations, and even those weren't met. How sad is that? Um, and so there they are at the tomb. They're wondering along the way, who's going to roll the stone away for us? Well, they get there and they're like, <gasps> stone's been rolled away. Now again, you might, you might think that, you know, that this is good news. And it, by the way, it is in the end. But they don't think so. They're, they're kind of alarmed by the fact that the stone has been rolled away. They're not thinking, oh, Jesus, is, now it all clicks. Now it all clicks. Because Jesus had told them again and again and again while he's alive, said, hey, listen, I'm going to be dead. They're going to kill me. But on the third day, I'm going to rise. You think somebody would have gotten it. And by the way, before we're hard on the ladies, let's talk about how much more brave they were than the men. Okay? The men, where are they? Nowhere. <laughs> right? They're hiding away in their own little tombs. They're scared to death. They've run and hid the moment Jesus got arrested. You know, the ladies, they actually show up. They showed up at the crucifixion. They are there watching. Most of the disciples know where to be found. They're there whenever Arimathea, Joseph of Arimathea, takes along with the Nicodemus and puts the body in the tomb. The ladies are there. They see him laid to rest. They see the stone rolled. We're told that there in the Gospel of Mark. They've seen the stone rolled shut. And so when they're getting there that morning, they're like, where is it? So, so you know, the, the ladies at least showed up. Now, one ironic thing about protection for them was this. Women in that society didn't really have any rights and were not really considered to be very important. It's a terrible thing to believe, but in a lot of that society it was true. And so ironically, that kind of protected them. That meant they could go be there at the sign of the crucifixion and probably not risk arrest or death themselves or other things like some of the male disciples but still that's an ironic thing and I still say whatever you want to say about the ladies not getting it let's be clear the guys were even worse so there they are they get to the empty tomb they don't know it's empty but it is they walk in it's not actually quite empty because there's somebody in there there's an angel, a messenger from God. And that, what, is, what is the look on the, the lady's face when they see the angel? Well, we're not told exactly except for the first line out of the guy's mouth is, don't be afraid, don't be alarmed, don't be scared. Obviously, they're scared in that moment too. And uh, he says, I know why you're here. Why, why would somebody show up first thing in the morning at a tomb, right? You're here because you came to see Jesus of Nazareth. 
He's not here. By the way, as he told you, he wouldn't be here. He's already gone ahead of you to Galilee. There you will find him. So one of the things I, I read about about this was how do you how do you take this story because I mean honestly the way that it goes in the gospel of Mark specifically now I will tell you that in some of your we read Mark 16 1 through 8 in some of your Bibles um, in most of your Bibles it'll tell you several things when you look through this little section because it's an interesting little history most of the oldest and most reliable manuscripts the ancient versions we have written down of the gospel of Mark stop right after verse 8 and they ran away and they were terrified oh great boy this is a happy story I see and, and they told nobody about what had happened and that's, that's how the gospel of Mark ends so they came in with low expectations they don't even get what they want a body isn't there and yet they're told the great news again hey Jesus is alive he's resurrected this is the greatest day in all of history it doesn't say that, but that's, it is. And they go away terrified and scared. How dare they? Like, and, I, and I do think you and I, we love to look at that and go, well, if I'd been there, I would have known. I would have said, oh yeah, Jesus, all right. Um, oh yeah, back to the Bible thing, by the way. Verses 9 through 20 are later editions. Now, there is some fun stuff in there, like handling snakes and uh, some stuff, the snake handling churches. Anybody ever been to one of those snake handling churches? Yeah, I actually have not, but I actually worked with some boys once who one of their jobs, uh, the ways they made a living was they caught rattlesnakes and sold them to the snake handling churches. Um, uh, but anyway, um, it ends at verse 8. The standard thing, why would the gospel end with such a downer thing? And would we have really thought any different if we would have been that there that day would we have been scared because you know our mindset is and rightly so dead people don't come back alive would we have had the faith to believe more now let's be clear the ladies eventually did the apostles eventually came out of their hiding they all died according to legend at least according to their faith we know some of them did because it tells us in the bible others we don't really know exactly but legends tell us they they did live out their faith. They did risk their necks for the gospel, and a number of them paid the price for it. But how, how far would you really be able, willing to go to believe? I mean, let's be clear. Some of you came here today. You're like the ladies there at the very end of verse 8. You're like, yeah, I don't really buy it either. I don't really buy this, this Jesus thing. It's a nice story. Um, a lot of, you hear all the time people saying a lot of bad things have been done in the name of Jesus. You know what? And they're not altogether wrong. Not that Jesus wanted those things, but people have invoked his name to, to legitimate them. Uh, but you're like, no, nah, dead people don't rise. This whole thing is just a way to make people feel good about themselves, about the world, to help them make sense of some stuff, but it doesn't make any sense. Well... You're not alone in that. There's a lot of people that believe that. And, you know, that's one way to partake of this ending in Mark that just says they went away terrified and told anyone because uh, who would believe such a thing and could it really be true? Now, there's a good number of you additionally who are here. And you say, you know, I believe it at least most of the time. I I think there's something to this but but we don't really always let it define our lives because well it is a guy that died 2,000 years ago even if he came back alive how does that really apply to me now well for you again I'm not going to convince you otherwise you're also not alone but man the world has changed because of Jesus and by the way it has changed for the better yes we've had our moments that aren't so that aren't great at all but but Jesus comes into my heart and into my life and and makes a difference and and sometimes it becomes if I ask you to think back have there been times you've prayed and God's answered your prayer you'll probably say yeah yeah I have but it kind of becomes we've so much become a what have you done for me lately and the microwave takes a whole three minutes to make my meal 
um, you know, um, how, I don't have that kind of time. Um, you know, we want instant gratification all the time. And yet, Jesus, if you pay attention, answers our prayers again and again and again. And then, and then there's those of us that are just, we know. We are so, we have seen it, we've felt it, we've experienced the love of Jesus in powerful ways in our lives, the power of the Holy Spirit upon us, that we just know. And we know and we know and we know that there is life and hope in him. One thing I saw, it says they did surveys of churches. I don't know exactly what the wording was, but what I thought was interesting is they said the chief finding on whether or not somebody comes back after they visited the church um, that, that drew them back was that they somehow felt that the people there were firmly convinced that Jesus was alive by everything they said and did. That there was a real life there. That you could feel something. It was tangible. And the people weren't just like, oh, it's Sunday, I've got to go to church. But that they were excited to be there. They were excited to serve. I see signs of that all, all over the place. From our kids, from our youth, from the musicians that are here every single week. To our choir, to our musicians, to the folks that do outreach and are excited about. You know, our food pantry, like... It got to be, it's gotten to be at times here lately, we assign two people there each, each session that we have it on Sunday afternoons and Wednesday afternoons, and often there's six or seven people sitting around down there because they just like to be here and be a part of it. They feel like they're making a difference, that there's life going on. We are called to life, and that's what Jesus offers us. May we have that life in him. He is alive. It is not just a story that we just go, what happened here? I and run and hide. The, the ladies figured it out. The guys eventually figured it out too. It usually takes the ladies convincing the guys. And that probably was what happened to have, had to happen here too. Um, but that, that Jesus is alive. And we know it. We feel it. In a mo few moments we're going to celebrate Holy Communion. And in the midst of that we experience Jesus' life force coming into our very bodies. And when I do that I feel his life. Entering mine in a new and powerful way, a renewal of life in Jesus, a renewal of his power and his love and his hope. I hope you feel that too. Let us pray together. Jesus, you are alive. We love you and we thank you so much for your love for us. Help us, Lord, to live with you and for you now and forevermore. You have given yourself fully for us. Let us give ourselves fully for you. And Lord, when we don't, when we... When we doubt, when we stray, Lord, call us back home. Bring us back. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And for those who are doubting today, whether you're a doubting Thomas or a doubting Mary, Mary, and Salome, Lord, we, we just ask that you would give us your signs. That you would show us anew your love and your power. To pull us back to you, to draw us to you. We thank you, Jesus, it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. If you're able, would you stand and join me as we recite together our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And as you are, let us go into our prayer for our our time of Holy Communion. Lord God, thank you for the beginning of time. You made us, you created us, you made all that is, all of it. From the stage I'm standing on, you made the bits and parts of it. You made me, you made everybody here. You made everything in the universe, blades of grass, trees, what computer chips are made out of, um, what, what Tostitos are made out of. All the things in the world, Lord, is something that you made. And it's all a good gift from you. And so, Lord, we just thank you for all of it. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. We learned how to corrupt things pretty quickly. You made only one rule. Don't eat the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. You said, on the day you eat of it, you shall die. 
And Lord, we know what happened very quickly. You, uh, when the serpent tempted Eve and she ate. Eve tempted Adam, he ate. And sin entered the world that day and it's been an awful presence here ever since. And every generation we've rebelled against you. We've fallen short. We've sinned. And yet you continue to send your prophets and your messengers, your people to us to call us home back to you. You use creation in other ways to call us to you as well. In the fullness of time, you sent your own son, Jesus, fully God, fully human, did not sin, loved, taught love, taught us so many things. And yet we treated him awfully. We killed him on a cross. It was our worst moment of history. And yet you turned it into the greatest moment when just two days later on Easter Sunday morning, you rose from the dead and you made this huge victory for us, Lord. You didn't do it to put on a show. You didn't do it for, to glorify yourself. You did it to glorify your heavenly Father, but also to bring us forgiveness, to defeat sin and death on our behalf. You didn't have that. You could have lived forever on your own just fine, but you did it for us. And Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that you've sent upon us, Lord. Work it in us, Lord. Take it deep. Take out all the sin and the things that uh, we fall short, Lord, and, and restore and renew our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that challenges us, encourages us, us as our advocate, as our hope. Lord, help us to be filled by your Spirit and follow your promptings. And Lord, be on these elements of bread and drink that they would become for us your body and your blood that we might be filled by you and your Spirit. Make us one with you and one with each other until we feast together that final day with you at your heavenly banquet. Pray this all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the night on which Jesus gave himself up for us, when the meal was over, he took the bread. He lifted it up in thanksgiving to God the Father. He broke it, gave it to us, his disciples, and said, Take eat, all of you. This is my body broken for you as often as you eat of it. Remember me. In the same way, he took the cup. He lifted it up in thanksgiving to God the Father, gave it to his disciples, you and me today, and said, Take, drink this, all of you. This is my blood shed for you in the blood of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, remember me. This time, I'd like to invite our communion helpers to come forward. As uh, they do, I'd uh, let you know that you do not need to be a member of this or really of any church that all who desire the love and the power of Jesus Christ are invited to come forward. Remember that Jesus said, Jesus said, let the children come to me. And so we invite all who desire the love and the power of Jesus Christ to be the guiding force in their hearts are invited to come forward and partake of this feast of salvation that Jesus himself has set for us. We'll be serving you at multiple stations. There will be one right here in the middle that is for gluten-free. And so if that is what you need, please come to this station. If not, if you'd say the gluten-free for the others and, and come to one of the other stations, we'd very much appreciate this. This is the table that Jesus has set for God's people.
hoping that Jesus Christ is set for us as people. giving us this gift of bread and drink and for all the gifts that this song and many others have lifted up that you have given for us. Lord, may you be honored and glorified. This is your day, not ours. May your name be honored and may you be praised. Amen. So we uh, prepare now for our final song. Just a few things. First of all, next Sunday, come back. It's going to be Youth and Children's and Scouting Sunday, all rolled into one. And so the, the youth and the scouts and the kids are going to be doing pretty well every element of the service next Sunday. Well, except for leading communion, but I'll lead that. They'll be communion servers, as they are pretty well every week here anyway. But um, come next week, it's going to be a lot of fun. And then that afternoon, 
from 4 to 5.30, we're going to have a continuation of our series on emotional and relational health forums, and it's from 4 to 5.30, and this one is When Teens Experience Anxiety and Depression. I can't tell you um, how rampant, uh, it is so rampant, the amount of anxiety and depression, the number of issues surrounding mental health of youth and children, and adults for that matter, so really encourage you to come be a part of that forum. Um, also, we'll be starting a new sermon series next week that will run through April, the last finish line um, after next Sunday, and so um, talking about how to finish life well. So let us uh, go forth and have one more song. All right, please stand and worship with us.
God and Lord God we are thankful that you are surely alive we come together this morning to proclaim your love for us to proclaim your awesomeness that you change our lives now and will for all the rest of eternity and for that we give you thanks and praise may we go forth as your Easter people today and all the days of our lives in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit go in peace amen my God's not dead he's surely alive and he's living on the inside Lord, like a lion, God's not dead, he's surely alive and